we are live. We're good to go? Yeah. Hi, folks. Welcome to our YouTube work live workshop. This is number five. five. And we got the, all the gang here. Jake is going to have to do a little pan, starting with Frick on the uh, main monitor. Very special guest all the way from Seattle, oh. Luther Sheely, retired colonel, U.S. Army, artillery, can't hear a thing. Right beside him is Megan, Jake's better half. All the way from... She's monitoring Facebook. And camera. from Alaska via New York, Super Dave Benson. Dave's one of our combat wounded vets. Came to our workshop way back in the fall of 2017. Now he's part of the team. And rounding, up, uh, rounding things out is Ken. Ken is the uh, best employee. Boy, better not say that. Ken's a great employee. <laughs> Ken's been helping us work works his butt off. And Jake's behind the camera. And we're all dressed with t-shirts. Purple Heart t-shirts. I'm going to give you this real quick, and then we'll just proceed. So our major focus is our Purple Heart Project. This is where we bring combat wounded veterans. We do seven four times a year, two in the spring, two in the fall. We bring them in and we treat them to a week of very intense hand tool workshop. How intense? Super intense. It's two weeks of woodworking packed into one week. Yeah, there is no downtime. Sleep only. In fact, we're even going to change it up so that all our meals, except for breakfast, are going to be right here so we don't lose any time. In here at 8 in the morning, we don't leave until 11 o'clock at night. You're going to learn a ton. So we always have seven civilians that come as regular students, along with the seven combat wounded vets. They come as our guests. We cover their airfare, their hotel, their meals, and we send each vet home with 2,000 US dollars worth of tools. If you're interested, if you are a combat wounded vet, whether it be a mental wound or a physical wound, don't be fooled by the name Purple Heart. It doesn't mean you have to have a Purple Heart in order to participate. All you have to do is go to our website, robcosman.com, and on the b tool banner, top left, says PHP. Drop down menu, Luther has packed so much information in there. Two weeks worth of information in one headline. And it'll tell you everything you need to know, including the sign up form. Only thing you need, real quickly, you need to be either active duty or honorably discharged. You need to be, uh, it has to be a combat related wound. Uh, you need to be able to get a passport because you've got to get into Canada. And you uh, have to write us at least a half a page telling us your story. Do it like you're talking to your therapist. You're not going to exaggerate, but you're not going to leave anything out. That's all we have to base our decision on. And we have the tough job of sitting down there and taking all those applications and trying to decide, like triage, who needs it most. Now, what I'm going to ask Luth have Luther do is read off the names of the 14 combat wounded vets that are coming to our workshop starting May 6th. And the reason why we're all here is because we're scrambling to get the shop ready. Howdy. If this is the first time that we're doing 14 vets. Uh, we've increased. Uh, previously, we only did 12. So uh, the first week, and I apologize if I get your names wrong or mispronounced, I should say, we have Joshua Briand from BC. We have Canadian. Canadian. That's where BC is, British Columbia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Jace uh, Beta from Florida. New Weatherhead from well, Washington. In fact, Neil only lives about three miles down the road from me. Uh, Ryan Beckman from Pennsylvania. Uh, Jeffrey O'Connor from uh, Virginia, Trenton Schumann from Kansas, Josh Jers from Michigan, Chris Cozum from North Carolina, Landon Beck from Florida, Thomas Grimstead from Iowa, George Peters from Tennessee, Derek Bowler from West Virginia, and I just remembered I left off Sean. This is the alternate? Yeah, Sean. Good. Sean, oh yeah, from uh, Southern Alberta. From Alberta. Uh, no, from Ontario. Well, but his family's in Southern yeah. Alberta. So Sean, Talk from, to them. sorry about that. Those so are all the vets explain coming. what happened, just so that they know. Uh, well, we had, uh, we had one uh, uh, vet that uh, called up, and he's still having some issues with, uh, with PTSD, so he kind of checked himself into uh, VA in treatment, and so he's not going to be able to come. And we had selected Sean as an alternate, as we always do. We have at least one alternate. So we pulled Sean up, and so he's coming. Uh, the, the vet that's uh, uh, in, in patient, he'll just come at another time when he's able to do that. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. And so we always have one alternate just in case this happens. So. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Um, what else? Are, oh, so we are, we are doing this to help you, but also we said, you know what? We need to do this as a fundraiser. A lot of people would like the opportunity to be able to participate. 
Can't all be here physically, but you can help in two ways. I'm going to tell you the most important one first. Find us combat wounded vets, our single biggest challenge. We picked 14 out of only how many applications? 60. Was it really 60? Yep. And in our, in our October class, we picked 14. Are we 12 out of? 34. 34. So we're not swamped by any means. Find them for us, please, and point them in our direction. Second thing you can do is financial help. We cover this. Uh, what we can't raise from private funds, we cover ourselves, and I don't, I don't begrudge that whatsoever. But if you would like to participate, I do this because of the way I feel when I do it. If you want that same feeling. Two ways. You can uh, donate on our site. I would prefer you actually do it. We've had people uh, do donations through YouTube. They take 35%. That's a, that's a huge chunk. Go right to our website under that same banner, PHP. It'll give you, a, on the drop-down menu, it'll give you various levels of donations that you can uh, participate with, and the, the f all the funds go to doing this. We don't take any wage out of this. This is all that money raised is uh, spent on getting the guys here, buying plane tickets, hotel meals, tools, whatever it is. Other thing you can do is buy one of our T-shirts to spread the word. Purple Heart Project, le lay over the uh, left breast, and wood is good, because it is on the backside. And we'll be happy to ship it out to you. And I'm, I'm missing anything? We're good. Quick, quick little recap of what we've been doing this week. I'm going to get Jake to poke the camera out here. So the scramble is May 6th is our first class. And uh, we've got to get the classroom ready. So we managed to get some sheetrock done, got the ceiling finished. Uh, we're encasing all the beams and cedar. I wish I could take you all the way over there and see it, but we'll show it to you when it's actually done. We're almost there. We've got to get the we've got to get a little bit of work done on the floor, and then uh, Jake and uh, Luther, and uh, Dave and I are going to be working on building benches. We need five more benches, but that's not a problem. Anything, Dave? Did I forget anything? Ken? No. All right, let's go. So today's tonight's episode is going to be on taking this beater. This is uh, Mastercraft. They don't make it. That happens to be if you're not from Canada, Mastercraft is a uh, in-house brand for a company called Canadian Tire, which would be, what would be the equivalent in the U.S.? Any idea? Goodyear. Uh, oh, no, maybe Harbor Freight. Maybe Harbor Freight Northern or Northern Tool. Well, Canadian, Canadian Tire factory. carries everything from lawn furniture to tools to sporting goods to tires. Anyway, so this cost, I think it was $39.95 Canadian, so that would be about $30 U.S. Uh, like a Home Depot. Brand. Home Depot? So what it's going up against, and I did this in the trailer we did, that is, uh, now that's a four, but I'm, I'm not a fan of a four. If you're an adult male and you want a smoothie, you buy a four and a half, not a four. That's an adolescent plane. I'll tell you why, if you really want to know. This is a, a Lee Nelson four and a half, and this is a Ron Breeze smoother. Okay, so just recap real quick. I think that cost me $1,200. Beautiful plane. This was $500 when it was sold. This is 175 And this, as I mentioned, was in, in staying with U.S. dollar currency. This was um, in the low 30s. So well, I'm going to keep this one out. And we're going to, if we have to compare, we'll use that one as the, uh, as the standard. Now, I sell, I sell Wood River in Canada. Not in the U.S., just in Canada. So I'm, I'm a little bit biased, but I also was involved in the design of the product. And uh, this represents what I consider to be the best value in hand planes, meaning you're going to get the most performance for the dollars that you spend. Lee Nelson makes the best planes, but what you're getting for the extra money isn't going to make a difference on the wood. I'll show you that at some point. So I'm, I have not opened this up. The uh, seal has not been broken. I'm curious. I have no idea what to expect. No, we don't. Jake, did you open that? Okay. Ken, would you grab me some uh, 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 paint thinner, please? So, first impressions. Frick, you're so used to doing unboxings. You tell me if I missed something. <laughs> Anything else in the box? Uh, no, nothing else in the box. Um, plastic handles. I can't uh, berate that because uh, they're only there to 
might hold on to it. There is a seam along there that might be a little bit irritating the hand, so you'd want to fix that. Thank you. Um, remove the lever cap. We'll have to check that. Do the same thing we do to any other plane. Take out the blade and chip breaker. There's some uh, crud on that to keep it from rusting. And now we look at the frog. I'm going to take this apart as well. Now, what I'm doing, and this is, the, this is the disservice that this type of a plane ends up being to somebody that's new. They don't know about this. But I'm going to go through and I'm going to do everything I can to eliminate the potential problems before they surface when we try to actually use a plane. So I'm taking out the frog. Loosen these two screws. I'll take that cap screw off too. Oh, is that gluten-free, dairy-free pizza that I'm going to pay a take in? No, you're just paying for it. Oh. All right. You got enough light, Jake? Mm -hmm. Now, this is actually a little bit better than most. So there's four contact points. And uh, I'll tell you right now that it's important, it's imperative actually, that all the contact points from the sole all the way up to the, to the lever cap, you need to have them, they need to be semi-precise because if they're not, they allow a little bit of vibration. And that turns into what we call chatter when you actually try Do to use the plane. To the contact point? Um, not yet, not yet. I'm gonna go through and see what we got. Mm -hmm. So, what's in where? I don't know, it looks like hay. So Rob, are you gonna can't, test it can't be shavings. Rob? No, no, that's ridiculous. I see. No, I see people doing that, and they're not going to test it out of the box. That would be, uh, no, that's, a plane does not come sharp, ready to use out of the box. Not e no, no plane does. They, they, yeah, exactly, good example. Taking, that, that's like taking your car from, uh, from the, dealers, from the uh, dealer's lot to the uh, racetrack. So, now I got that on that one. Now, I will show you some things that I don't like. You see how rough that casting is? In fact, if you look at it, there's still paint down here, so they've kind of skipped and missed. I don't know how bad it is. We'll find out. We'll put it on the stone. We want that to be nice and flat because we need that blade to lay on there. Okay. Now, I'm just going to get some of that cosmoline off there. Not a lot of mating surface, but we'll see how well it... Jake said that's a good deal for uh, ebony handles. Who said that? Someone named Jake. Jake said it's a good deal for ebony handles. 30 bucks with ebony handles? Yeah. <laughs> ebony resin, we'd call that. Now, and I don't worry about a number four having square sides. This is not the plane that I would use on a shooting board, so I don't care if the sides are square. Sole needs to be flat. And that'll be the uh, that'll be the first thing that we check, but I gotta get all the rest of this undone first. Not not a uh, big fan of these little wee skinny blades. And that's the old style. Look at the Okay, there's there's uh now I I'm telling you the truth. I have not opened this up unless somebody bought it and returned it, which I'm a little suspicious because the bag was, uh, the back end of the bag wasn't sealed. But there's, there are wood shavings on there. It's not been sharpened. Nobody's attempted to sharpen it. Ken, I'm sorry to make you run again. Would you grab the micrometer? I just want to measure the blade and see how thick it is. Thank you. The finest steel. Where's this made? Did you see, find out where it was made? My guess would be India. Check that over and see if you can find anywhere where it says where it's made. Now the chip breaker, this has been used I think because the chip, the edge of the chip breaker is kind of beat up. Oh, China. Hey, I'm gonna go underneath there. 
Okay, don't like the lateral adjustment lever. It's one piece, but we can make it work. Surprisingly enough, the yoke is actually one piece. On the very cheapest ones, it's usually two pieces of stamp steel, just held, to, actually not even held together, just sitting on there loose. Okay, now let's, uh, let's see how flat the sole is. I, there's several ways of doing flattening the sole. You can get a piece of float glass, not plate. It has to be float. You can get a, um, a granite block. And I don't know how accurate these are. I know what they're advertised, but I don't know if I believe it. You can, on a small plane like that, you could actually use your, if you have a good brand table saw or jointer table. I'm going to use this so we can stay here. And I'm going to use um, 120, 120 grit Porter Cable paper. And what I like about this is it's, uh, it's adhesive backed. Actually, what I'll do is I'll put two strips on there side by side so we don't have to change it as often. It's really good for the knife. Yeah, it sharpens it, that's right. It's not moving. Actually, I'll put a bench dog in there just in case. Now, just so we can see this a little bit better, do we have a Sharpie? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't want that real fine one. I want a heavier Sharpie. Yeah, see if you can find one. I don't think I've got. Well, actually, Dave, never mind, Dave. I've got a. I've got this one. So I'm just going to put some marks on this. See if we can tell. I assume if there's a question, you're going to ask it, right? Yep. Now I'll make sure that these are tight. Okay. I give it a little bit more than that, but that's not a very good sign. So we're making contact here, a little bit back here, and up there. Now, I'm just curious as to how far out it is, so let's shoot. Jake, do you know where my uh, feeler gauge is? Right here. I'm, I'm going to use my Lee Nelson number 8 as the, uh, as the reference. Yeah. Start off with a that one should be a thou and a half. So we'll set this on it. So it makes contact. Bob, I want, Bob, I want to give you yeah. a question here is um, a Dave asking uh, should you have the Fog and the blade in and tight when you're checking the sole? Um, yeah. There's probably a good reason to do that in terms of it's going to introduce a little bit of stress to it, but I don't think it's going to be enough to bother it. I just want to, I actually just want to get an, a rough idea of how far out this is. So I can move the thou and a half. So we've got a, a high spot right underneath the handle, but from here to here, I can easily move a thou and a half. That's not terrible. Let's bump it up to something a little more dramatic. There's a three thou. Okay, so I can still move a three thou. So there's 
There's three thou easily comes out of right here, right at the throat, both the head and back, and then right at the end of the tote. So let's go one more. That is a five thou. No, sorry, that's two. These things aren't in order. There's a four thou. There's there's a five thou. All right, let's see what this does. You. That's grabbing. Okay, so it's not out five thou anywhere. So somewhere between three and five. So let's see if we can actually remove that amount. Now I've got a, I've got a, a nice general belt sander over there, that if I have to, I'll go over to, I'll go over and use just to speed this up. But I'm trying to mimic what you're going to end up with, if you don't have a fully equipped shop. Now when you do this, you want to have the pressure right in the same way that you would when you're planing, so equal on both the front front knob and the rear tote. Oh, I didn't check that. Was there any twist in that? I don't think so. What brand of feeler gauges were those? What brand of feeler gauges? Yeah. No name on them. Oh, China. China brand. China brand. Nothing on them. Okay, so we're making contact on the right out here in the toe on both sides. There seems to be a hollow in the middle. Let's see if we can get rid of that. What are you going to do? Put another one over here. Now, I, I, I didn't go any coarser than 120. Actually, that's the course I have, because I find that you get down too coarse and it's harder to move material for some reason. And I wouldn't go, I'm not going to get any finer than 120, meaning I'm not going to go up to 150 or 220. Ken, I bug you again. Can you get the vacuum cleaner? I just, instead of blowing this around, I'm just going to vacuum this off and it'll keep the paper working. Okay, now the critical area for a plane, performance-wise, is right here, directly in front of the throat, and that's coming close. However, the problem you encounter if you have a hollow, you start here, your plane comes on, and then as you move the rest of the plane on, it's going to, the blade is going to disengage as the high spot or the low spot, whatever you want to call it back here, it comes, uh, it makes contact with the wood, and it's essentially lifting that blade out, out of the wood. Then when you get to the end of the board, as the front falls off, the blade goes back into the wood, and it's very difficult to get any kind of performance out of something like that. So you need to have a flat sole. I don't, you don't have to be optically flat, but I would certainly want to be within a thou and a half. Luthi, keep me on track time-wise so I can make sure we finish. Thank you. Any time. We're at 25 minutes right now. That paper still has lots of bite. Thank you.
Don't push down too hard. It's too easy to lose control. Okay, I still have a little bit of material maybe to remove there, but that's not terrible. Um, I'd like to get, see you got this area right in through this, not making any contact. I'd like to get a little bit there. It's not, not imperative that it be complete everywhere, but I like to, I'd like to have some high spots or contact points, I should say. So in deciding on a plane like this, you got what you have to balance is you buy a wood river and this is already done. You, sh you don't have to do this. Same thing with a, with a, uh, a Lee Nelson. And so far, I certainly don't have a lot invested in a little bit of sandpaper and a bit of elbow grease. Okay, it's coming. Maybe I'll give it another uh, another couple of minutes, a little more air. Did you want to go the other way on the station? Huh? Did you want to go the other way on that station? Yeah. You mean turn around that way? Go sideways. Well, then, then it's too short, and you're not. I, I'm doing this, trying to keep the plane on the uh, abrasive the whole time. Now, just in case you're curious, that side is out. I would guess and say it's. That's 20 thou. So, uh, hey, Rob, uh, what's, uh, what's the surface 20 thou. What's the surface plate material over there? Is that marble? What is that? Granite? Granite. The That's granite a Yeah. Okay, so if, you, uh, like I said, this doesn't matter, but just uh, for the sake of evaluating it. So, on this side, I have a gap that is well past 20 thou. And this gap is on the inside. No, I said I said well past twenty. No, it's not twenty. Oh yeah, well it's really close. The gap's here, and then on this one, it's the reverse. The gap is out there. So if you had to use that to shoot with, you're going to be in. You got a lot of work to do, and I wouldn't even bother. Okay, so we've essentially, we've gotten rid of all of the ink up here in the toe directly, which means we would now make this function uh, for the reason it's designed to, which is to hold, put pressure on the wood fiber directly ahead of the cutting edge. And we're making contact. I mean, it's, we've we actually started to scratch the surface here. There's a bit of a hollow right underneath here, but I got contact here and here. So I'm going to say that'll be all right. We'll try that. Okay, now a little more air again, Ken, please. Go. Okay. Now the face of this. Uh, if I was going to go through this and do everything that I normally would do, I would go in and I would file off this. So I could take this pin complete, that pin completely out, take, remove the lateral adjustment lever, so I could work that whole surface. And you know what? 
I'm going to do it anyway. I, I have time. So let's remove that. That's pretty sloppy, but it'll still work. We've got to take that pin out in order to get... Actually, we don't have to take the pin out. The yolk, the yolk will drop right below the surface, so I don't need to worry about that. I can leave that in. But in order to lay that flat, I've got to get rid of the, uh, the lateral adjustment lever. And the easiest way to do it is to file that pin... And this is no big deal. I'll show you how we get, reattach it. File that down until it completely disappears and we'll end up having to touch some of this casting. Ken, do you know, can you find me a countersink? Hook me up a countersink and a cordless drill, please. Okay, so there the, the head's gone. Now, uh, the small one will do, but I want it to be that I want it to be a sharp one. Okay, we need to knock that pin out. I've actually broken one of these before, not on purpose. Uh, I need a couple pieces of wood the same thickness. I can do it right there. That'll come out. I'm just going to punch that pin. Okay, now to, in order to put it back in, oh, I meant the, uh, in order to put that back in, I'm going to cut a countersink on this back side. That's pretty soft. And then when we're done, we'll put the pin back in, and then we'll just peen that to fill some of that that uh, countersink we just cut, and then it's back to functioning. So now let's see how bad this is. I'll move that yoke forward. Well, uh, that would this I might think. Oops. Okay, so we're making contact. This is always the problem. We're making contact right here, and we're making contact up here and up here. So this surface isn't flat, which means in its current state, if we had put this back together, the blade would actually not be making contact out as it sits like this. See that? So the problem is you get part of that blade that's literally sitting in midair. And that's, you know, they talk about chatter. That's the reason why. So let's go in here and see if we can't fix this. There goes my glove. Oh, yeah, I wanted to tell you how thick the blade is. My guess is it's going to be about 70 thou. No, it's 85. Isn't that a standard or an old standard? Uh, they were anywhere 75 to 85. So when you're doing this, you want to distribute the pressure as uniformly as possible. So I've got two fingers up here and my two thumbs back here. I'm just trying to keep that that uh, that yoke from catching when I move this forward. Okay, so now we've got full full machine surface here. We're start we're we're making contact here. We haven't gone all the way to the end. We've got a big hollow in here. You see, we haven't touched anything in the middle. We're touching out here. So I, I get a little bit better than that. How do I hold my hands on that thing like that? It's 
pretty soft cast, so it doesn't take a whole lot of work. Ken, air please. Is there anybody watching? Get over 300. Quiet. Are they shy? Oh, is he? Well, I'd like to hear what the uh, feedback yeah, the, is. The, the, biggest, the biggest questions right now is really about whether you should be flattening the sole with that frog in and lock in, put stress on the sole to find. A lot of comments on that. Yeah? Yep. Well, to make them happy, when we put it all back together, we'll go into a scratch pattern, put everything under under tension, and see if it makes a difference. How's that? That's what I told everyone we were going to do. You're at 40 minutes. Really? Okay, there. Now we're now we're. Uh, this, uh, I've done three or four hundred old Stanleys when I used to teach this class, and at this point we've got full contact here. The only area we're missing is right in there, and I can't really tell you that that's going to make much a, a difference at all. The blade's going to be well seated; it's almost supported. And you got to remember that with the bevel on the bottom side, the blade leaves the face of the frog somewhere out here, so that little corner doesn't make any difference. For the sake of another couple of seconds. Get that thing out of the way. I just flipped this around. Go the other way. Okay. So that's done. Now let's get this back in place. Put that pin in. Tap that all the way through. Now I need a uh, I need a pointed there set. And I need some metal to pound on. Ken, would you grab me my little anvil down there, please? You know where it is? Okay, we'll wait until we get that in order to fix that. Nothing we can really do with that or nothing I want to do with that. We, we'll check this right now. So we want the underside of the lever cap to be flat so that when we cock it and put pressure, it's being distributed uniformly across the width of the blade. If, if it was concave, which sometimes it is, that means all the pressure goes on the outside corners, pushing the corners of the blade down. And now you have these terrible plane tracks. Um, I, w I want something to sit right there. But maybe I can just put a piece of, huh? Well, I've got this all set up. So if I just had a piece of, um, yeah, right there is good. If I had a piece of paper. Okay, this is just to protect this side. Okay, so we got the exact opposite. Let me let me paint that. Where's my uh, marker? Okay, we'll do that again. So what I'm doing here, I don't want to wear on this, so that's why the piece of paper is keeping that from making contact with the abrasive. Distribute your pressure as uniformly as possible. So you can see I've got five fingers on there. Okay, so that's what we have. Now, that's actually not bad. That's better than being concave. That means the pressure sitting in the middle, which you're not going to deflect it. You're not gonna, you're not gonna end up with big heavy plane tracks. I would like to have it a little bit better than this, so. What's the matter, Lou?
Okay, so we've managed to stretch that out from this end all the way over to here. I'll give it another, I'll give it another uh, minute and then we'll be satisfied. You're not gonna gain a whole lot by stretching it all the way out to the edge, but. Trying to hold on to this thing is difficult. Okay, I'm not gonna. I'm not gaining what I want, so I'm not gonna worry about that little bit. Performance improvement would not be uh, measurable, so don't worry about it. Now, the lever, uh, the uh, chip breaker. So when that sits on the plane. There's a gap, obviously a big gap, from back here to out here, and the pressure of the lever cap comes down on that on that bump, and that distributes the pressure out onto the cutting edge, and that helps to stabilize it. So there should be a negative angle in here. If it wasn't, when you put pressure from the lever cap, it'll pop this off, and it'll leave a gap between the end of the chip breaker and the back of the blade, and that's where shavings get jammed. So in order to fix that, I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to use a diamond stone instead. What well, I got a 600. I use this 180 grit actually, and I want to have I want to have the uh, back of the chip breaker lower than the front. Three fingers to distribute the pressure. Stay within the. Uh, close to the edge. Now I'm making contact right out there. That could actually be sitting lower. I'll take that away and try it. I'm using this dry. I, I could wet it, but not a big deal. Okay, so there's, can you see where, can you easily see where I'm making contact? I'm, I'm stretched, I'm actually making contact all the way out here and to there, but I want to go all the way across. Get a bump, kind of an off-centered bump on this. It's not really hard metal, so it won't take terribly long to fix. Don't push down too hard. The harder you push, the less control you have. So I'm using what I would call light to moderate pressure. And remember, you've got to maintain that negative angle on the underside of the chip breaker in order to ensure that the leading edge is what touches the back of the blade when it's under the pressure applied by the lever cap. Okay. I'm within uh, an eighth of an inch on this side. I'm a quarter of an inch away on that side. And I'm using, by the way, this is a uh, trend diamond plate. It's double-sided. This is a different one than you normally see me use. This one is 180 grit on one side, 600 on the other. So it's a little faster cutting than the 300 that I normally would have. Throw a bit of moisture on there. Okay. This, huh? okay. The reason I'm playing, staying out here close, if you get in there, you're going to be touching back here. So I don't have a whole lot of range. And I keep slipping off the edge. That's moving slow. I'm uh, still a quarter of an inch away. 
and I'm on this side I'm probably a sixteenth of an inch away just for the sake of it I'm gonna clean the top side too so I'm gonna set that on there raise it up so that I'm trying I'm gonna work right on the very leading edge see if we can't just make that a little sharper it's kind of rounded over and not very precise I've got four fingers to distribute the pressure as uniformly as I can I'm locking my wrist and my elbow pivoting from my shoulder to try to keep that I don't want to rock like this I just want to cut little short circle small circles Okay, that's really out of whack. Um, can you see that? that? I'm only touching on the outside corners. Mm -hmm. Curious as to how far out that actually is. Ooh, a fairly big hollow. Well, that matches what's going on there, right? So, somebody said about trying this out of the box. This would not have performed very well out of the box. In fact, it wouldn't have performed. No comments? So how long did you just put them down in stone's lap? I think they guarantee them for five years. So you trans will last approximately five years? Yeah. And I mean, that's a hard question to answer too because it depends on how much use you give them tank of gas and my wife's car lasts about an hour can okay. you uh, show a little bit more what you mean when you say locking your hands yeah so what I was doing right there I had four fingers to distribute the pressure uniformly I uh, have this habit of squeezing my right thumb between my left thumb and my left index finger, so it ties the two hands together, so I'm not operating with two independents. They're, they're working together in unison. Like the well-oiled machine that we are. I just, I'm, I'm feeling for a burr on the underside so that I know I'm, I'm right out on the edge. I got a bird there. I don't know whether it's come off or it's breaking down, but I'm going to come up a little bit higher on this. This is the old style chip breaker. The new ones are flat, much easier to address. Okay. Now we'll go back to this. Now one of the things I could do is I could raise this back end up and I would still have enough clearance but it would take a lot less time because instead of removing all of that metal I would just be working right out at the very edge. So let me just uh, let me just verify what I just said that I have the clearance. So if we set that on there No, there's not a lot. I'll try raising it up a little bit. Jake, give me the... Uh, well, that's one of the reasons why I don't like using liquid on this when I'm doing this kind of a test because it makes the ink disappear. You have to dry the silly. difference all 
Well, we're essentially all the way over on this side and we're about uh, 3 sixteenths of an inch away on that one. I can't afford to spend too much more time here, but I'll give it another minute or two. Time check, Lou. 52 minutes. Can't go any further. I ran out of time. Now I got to get rid of the burr, but I can do that on a piece of pine. Just flip that back and forth until it disappears. Here, it's not coming off. Okay, so that's done. Those two, and we can do the we've got the anvil so we can work on the work on the uh, putting that frog back together so what I need to do is I need to get some metal directly underneath that so another question coming in Rob yeah uh, from uh, Dave is can the leading edge of the check chip breaker can you joint that with the fine file instead of doing it on a diamond plate uh, yeah, you could certainly get it close. We, we could have taken a file to it and sped up the process. And, but I still think you, you need a nice flat stone in order to get it um, to a finished state. Don't know yet. Hmm? Yeah, I know, but I'm going to try to sit right on the edge. <coughs> Dave, come here, please. I need you to hold... I need you to hold the uh, frog back here. A little bit of pressure right there. No, I gotta be able to hit. You just hold it back there. Now what I'm gonna do is just go in here and right on the edge. Okay, that's good, thank you. So what we did is we peened that over to fill in that that countersink and that'll keep that from falling off but it'll still allow it to function. Okay. Huh? Yeah, but just before we do the blade, I want to see how well this sits. Oh my. No, well, that can't be. Okay, so this this needs to be there. These two contacts, these two contacts, these two, and these two need to sit here, 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 and here, and that can't it can't wobble. It's got to be it's got to be properly uh, seated. I'm just going to take my file and just clean that burr up. It was a result of what we did on the face. <coughs> Let's try that again. So there's where it sits. Oh, wow. Can you hear that? Mm -hmm. Oh, I can. So that is really, really out of whack. 
that should be sitting perfectly still not wiggling side to side I'll show you how we might be able to fix it but let's go uh, let's work the blade Nah, let's do that instead that's gonna take some time so here's what I'm going to do I'm gonna take some of this adhesive back paper and I'm gonna put a piece on the right width Stick it right here. And I'm going to take another strip. I'm going to cut this one. What's the matter? So Daryl McKay asked you, if the plane doesn't work, how far do you think it will go when you throw it away? <laughs> Well, we may have a hard time auctioning this one off. Really good adhesive on this stuff, by the way. Okay, now I'd like to hold this in place, so I'm going to clamp it in lightly. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to distort it, worse than it is. enough to keep it from moving. I'm going to set this in place. Actually, let's uh, let's paint these and see. Blue might not be the best color. I was just going to say we're so coordinated here. side to side, a little forward and back, trying to keep even pressure on it. Okay, we managed to touch in all four places, which is odd because I could tell the thing was rocking, but then that would just be me not being able to hold it steady. I'm going to focus on keeping the front two in contact. So the majority of the pressure is on my two middle fingers, left hand, right hand. And then we'll try to bring the back ones, whichever one is high, into alignment. So can you tell which one's getting worked? This one seems to be quite heavily worked, as is that one. This one not so much. These ones seem to have been high on the back. Jamie Newton asked, uh, would it be appropriate to try to fix that air with shim stock? Well, yeah, you could, but a bit of a pain, especially if you plan on moving your frog, adjusting your frog, although this is not the plane to be trying to do that with. I suppose you could. What's, what's more of a pain to keep checking with different thicknesses of shim stock to find out where the high side is and when it's quieted down or to do this? Your call. Remember, this stuff is pretty soft, so it doesn't take a whole lot to, uh, to move enough to make a difference. Now, I'm making contact on all, all I'm going to, even though there are eight, I'm going to call them four. I'm gonna take this off. Are you... Should you be reversing what you're sanding? Reversing what I'm sanding? Yes. Wouldn't you suppose that the cast body would be harder than the... Well, no, I think they're made of the same material. Okay. And I, the reason I'm not, san I'm not putting the sandpaper on here and working on this is because this has the least amount of surface area compared to this. Well, that did it. That no longer rocks. Okay, let's put this frog back in. There 
is no uh, there is no captive screw to move the frog forward so if you're going to do it you just have to do it by eye <coughs> Uh, Joseph Mensch just uh, donated $250 to the Purple Heart Project. Thank you, Joseph. Huge supporter of what we do. Could you move your phone? You want us to shout out the T-shirt buyers? Or is that a last week thing? No, that uh, no. Yeah, yes, get, absolutely. Shout them out. These people need to be recognized. Remember, let your light so shine. What um, what what were we gonna say about Joseph? Oh, his sauce <laughs> that I'm working on. Joseph, I have not forgotten. Jake's on me all the time. Your saws are in the in the process. Okay, so that's that's secure. Now I only I did that just by eye. Now before we go any further with the blade, I'm gonna come in here and just do what I would normally do. These edges, especially after sanding that we did, are really sharp. So I'm gonna cut these back put a bit of a radius who's buying t-shirts now I do this for a couple of reasons number one comfort because it's really sharp number two if you happen to bump the edge of your plane against another piece of metal, it'll leave a bump or a mark, a ding. That produces a bump on the bottom, and now when you when you plane, you end up having a uh, a mark left in your wood. And number three, if you don't do that, sometimes it'll actually steer the plane. So you're working a large surface, and you're planing on an angle, and it makes the plane want to go off like that. So it's just Makes it a little easier to control. Now we'll do the nose, or the toe, and the heel as well. This one's a little bit tougher. Sean McDermott says you have sexy legs. I would expect that from Sean. Sean was in our very first Purple Heart Project class, and. Uh, He and Angela are in love. Now, there shouldn't be any burr on here because I've already removed the surface. But I, if there was, I would just go in there and do this. Cut that back. If I was I had any on the edge, I use the corner of my file or the edge of my file to go in and cut that back. Do the same thing on this side, obviously. This surface needs to be guarded because this is the surface that will bear down on the uh, on the wood fiber directly ahead of the blade. So you want to go in and make sure that you keep that surface square to the or perpendicular to the sole. And on a cheap plane like this, I would probably have to come in and match this to the blade projection. Simply because it doesn't look terribly straight. In fact, it isn't. But I'm not going to worry about it because it's not going to hurt for the kind of performance we're going to try to get out of this tonight. Put that screw back in. Now, this is really annoying. So I'm going to just see if I can cut it back with the file. just a burr on there okay that's good that was not bad okay last thing is the blade what they do with it 
All right, we're going to employ the Charlesworth ruler trick. Save so much time. Instead of preparing the entire back of that blade, we're going to use a little steel rule. I'm going to create this back bevel first, and I'm going to use the 180 grit just because I don't know what to expect from this blade. So the steel rule sits flush with the edge of the stone. Blade goes down on its back. I'm going to work and stay within a quarter of an inch of the opposite edge. Now, one of the big disadvantages of these little thin blades is that they flex under the weight of your fingers. So I've got to distribute the pressure as uniformly as possible. I've got three fingers out there. Not putting a lot of downward pressure. Now, I do this a lot, so if you look over here, I run my pinky along the edge of the stone so that when I'm moving this forward and back, I'm not fishtailing all over the place. My right and my left hand is holding the rule in place because I don't want that to move. Now, we've got a blade that is concave, but that's actually good because we have two resting points. Can you see them? Mm -hmm. We're touching here and we're touching there. That's acceptable because that means they will sit on those two high points and we simply work that until that joins in the middle. If it were the opposite, if it was convex, it would rock like this and you essentially can't fix it. Uh, I'm probably three quarters of an inch away from actually making contact. See if we can speed it up a little. Okay, we're, we're now that far away from touching, so we're down to about 7 sixteenths, maybe 3 eighths. Light to moderate pressure. like we're actually making contact but I want to make it a little bit more so I'm going to flip it over and I'll use the 600 grit side got to refine it anyway I got to take that up all the way to the 16,000 which is the final stone that we use Dave anything you want to say Dave came in, flew in last Sunday, and is going to be here two weeks helping us get ready. He's been staying with Jake and Megan. Well, he spent one week resting and preparing. We've had him uh, working on saws. He and Jake have been doing something. I'm not sure what. Oh, doing that wall. Okay, you want to take a look at that? Now this is where we, we want to refine this. You got to back off and use less pressure. What's up, Louis? You want to see? No, I'm looking at the stone. Yeah, why? What are you thinking? You see what size you're using? I'm using the 600 right now. I find the really coarse ones almost feel like they're not biting. I sometimes think you get farther with the finer or a little bit finer stone. Okay, so I've made contact all the way. So what we're trying to do is you can see these grinding scratches that came from the factory. If you don't address those, but they leave a serrated edge out here on the very tip of the blade. So we have to, normally the old way was we would lay that flat and we would go in and we would address that entire surface only to use out here. So what David Charlesworth came up with was that if you were to elevate the blade less than a degree, instead of having to remove all this scratch scratches out here, you only have to work the very leading edge, and it just speeds up the whole process tremendously. Now I'm going to use my 1,000 grit, and then I'll jump right up to my 16.
I'll just list some uh, T-shirt purchases. Okay. <clears throat> Gary Burnett, Troy Ryder, Philip Lawrence, and Kevin Geslinger. Thank you, gentlemen. And we also had a donation from David Ducharme for fifty dollars. Thank you, David. What did I just send him? Uh, joining class, Ken Wido. Oh yeah, is it? Would he have it yet? Mm. David, it's in the mail. Somewhere between me and you. And uh, Joseph had, had mentioned that his donation is actually to give away some T-shirts uh, to some of the vets that are in the chat tonight, so that they can promote the cause. That are in the. Uh, that are in our YouTube chat. Oh, to, oh yeah. That was that was his donation. So he's so donating. Two hundred fifty dollars worth of T-shirts to some of the vets that are in the chat. So how are we going to identify them? Tell them to speak up. Okay, so if you're a, if you are a uh, combat wounded vet in the audience tonight, please let this man do this nice deed and uh, buy you a T-shirt, which is a great idea. So speak up, and then we'll give you a shout out. Do you have a honing guide on your bench someplace? Do I? Oh, it must be the angle trainer. Yeah, there's an angle trainer sitting right there. But I do have a honing guide. I only use it when we're doing the back of a, right here. That, we use that when we're doing a, a, high, a um, high angle blade. We do it to make the 20 degree back bevel. So I don't. I think I was going to mention this. I don't think I got to. If you're pushing down too hard, you're never going to get this nice flat little polished spot, because the blade, as I said, will you, you deflect it. That's part of what I'm uh, worrying about uh, working with right now. Now I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump over to the sixteen thousand. Oh, this is? Where's the 16? That is a 30. In here? Mm -hmm. I'm using the 300 grit side. Trend diamond plate to flatten that 16. I don't normally work at this height when I'm doing this type of work, but I don't want this mess on my bench either. This is all one time procedure. Once you do it, you don't have to redo it. Any any anybody lay claim to a t-shirt yet? Yeah, a couple. Who are they? Talk, shoot them, shoot them out. Megan's taking notes here. Oh, okay. <coughs> How much is the shipping on a t-shirt? Okay, so. Joseph's 250 will go to the t-shirts. We'll, we'll pick up the shipping. That way we can get uh, 20, how many t-shirts? 10, 12? Okay, now I'm going to do the, uh, the uh, cutting edge. So find your primary bevel, reference it, come up off of it about 3 or 4 degrees. I'm working on the 1,000 grit diamond stone. Get a burr that runs all the way across corner to corner. So I've got to be able to feel that burr. Then I'm going to come over here to the 16,000. Do the same thing. Find your primary. Come up a little bit higher than I did on that previous stone. Spend about 10 seconds on this. And then I'm going to put downward pressure in one corner for three seconds. 
followed by the opposite corner for three seconds. I just saw the burr fall off. If you want to see it, there's part Power of it right 20. there. See that? Can you see it? I need to get a background. Mm -hmm. There. There's part of the wire burr. Mm -hmm. Okay. My last step is to flip this over and get rid of that anything that's left of that burr. Now I don't I don't expect tremendous performance from this blade, but we will see. Okay, put the chip breaker on. Who is it? Now I'm I'm uh, about a thirty second of an inch away. Thanks, Dave. Or should I say Vanna? I'm just going to get a bit of compressed air and blow this out. I forgot to put the adjuster knob back on. <coughs> Chloe. Can you it's reverse thread, right? Shouldn't be. What do you mean it shouldn't be? It is. Jim says to don't don't forget to check the sole before putting the blade. I I'm ahead of him. Okay, so the blade's up out of the way, seated down there. Oh yeah, Dave took the granite plate away. We've been calling him a little less than Super Dave. What did he do with it? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Okay, so I evaluate how much pressure based on how easy it is to adjust with the lateral adjustment lever. I want a little bit more than that. Okay, so that's operating pressure. Now, for those members of the uh, Flat Earth Society, I say that because I think I used to be one of them. I thought that uh, flatness of the sole was more important than it is, meaning the tolerance. Thank you. Is that paper still grabbing? Yeah, because it has some grit. Has it actually made a difference? It'll give it 10 seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Well, we had made contact in here and we're not, so maybe so. I gotta rejoin the Flat Earth Society. How are we of time, Luther? Hour and 21. Okay, we'll try to finish up in an hour and a half. That'll give me enough time to get this finished and to uh, try this out. I got some cedar, some walnut, and some maple. So, so far for vets who want a t-shirt, it's Tim Fredneck, Sean McDermott, uh, Pancova Collective is the username. Howard Bingham, Sean Tedler, and Matt 
Brueggemann. 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 Do that now to make sure he said your name right. Hi. Yeah. I think we know all those guys. If we missed anybody, just uh, let us know in the chat. Okay. Let's try this out. See if we're going to cannibalize future sales of planes. Yep, you have that, Dave. I liked you better when you were blonde. All right, we'll start off with a nice piece of yellow cedar. <coughs> what? No, no. A little bit of wax. Reduce the friction. Now, sighting down the sole, spin the adjuster knob till that blade appears. Is it? Do I need to move the frog forward? It should be there soon. How much room have I got left? Ooh, just showed up. Okay, I'm running out of space, but I, I made it. So now I'm adjusting the uh, blade to get it parallel to the sole. I'm going to retract it. So it's not, it's, I, I don't see it now. I'm going to start planing. to the uh, heavy on the right. Hear that noise? That's the only thing I don't like about these. Has that hollow ring. All right, so on a piece of, Jake, you do a lot of that. Grade it. Good as you would expect. Yeah. Now we'll try it on a piece of walnut. I, I, uh, can you hear the? I hear. I don't know how well the camera picks Feel that. that? There's a hollow ring. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Now I'm going to do the surface of this piece of maple. Close the throat down. I'm going to pull the blade in a little bit. Oh, there's a big, uh, well, that's a nasty piece. Uh, I want to try to be fair. Let's just try the edge. Actually, you know what? Whatever I hit threw this thing completely out of whack. Yeah, that's odd. There it is. Drove the blade back quite a bit. So, Grove Russell asked, uh, it seems like a lightweight plane. Are you getting any uh, chatter or feel like it's jumping on you because of the light? Oh, yeah. I don't know if you guys, I, I thought you guys would be able to hear it. It's uh, it it rings hollow. Yeah, but he's asking more about is it more difficult to hold the plane sole flat to the wood because of the, the plane, like, does the the plane jump around? It, it's not. Uh, it'll do the job. I can't say that it's fun because for that very reason you don't have any weight. Now, in comparison, let's let's pop this out really quick. So this is 
Now, apples to oranges here because that's a four. This is a four and a half. I don't have number fours. Don't like them. And they're too small. But I'm going to go through and sharpen this real quick. And we'll just see what kind of a uh, performance improvement we can get. Find your primary. Come up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Get a burr. Guns corner to corner. And the 16,000. Find your primary. Come up a little bit higher. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The end of ten seconds. Put downward pressure in one corner for three seconds, then the opposite. Take your steel rule on the edge of the stone. Remove the burr. Okay. My biggest criticism is just that hollow ring. It just lacks the mass. Um, I would suspect that uh, part of the uh, part of the problem is the way the frog is seated to the sole. It's it's pretty flimsy. There's not much contact surface there at all. And I'll take one of these apart real quick and show you when we're done. You see the face of the frog, you've got considerably more surface area. You also have a blade that's 120 thou thick versus 75 or 85, whatever that was. Bring that blade out, get it parallel to the sole, and I'll retract it. A little bit of wax. I'm just advancing it slowly. Now, I don't know if you can tell by the sound, but there's considerable difference. Now, where's that piece for the, I tore that big chunk out. So I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna turn this around and see if I can't Clean this up and get it looking a little bit better. And once I get this flat, I'll take the other plane to it and see what it does. You're at an hour and a half now. Okay. Are they dropping like flies? Not just all here. Hit 400. Okay. Now I'm pulling the blade in because I don't want to start out too far. And then I'll gradually advance. Now I'm going to go in here and tighten this up again just in case. Ugh. That, uh, it went from not engaging to engaging too much. Now why would that why would that come apart like that? Hmm. Try that again. I, I'm looking at that. It's almost like this is raised up too high and it's making contact with the back side of this bolt head and the least little bit of pressure and it slides that back and, that, and knocks it out kind of an analysis on the fly as to what's going on. Well, what? Did you use knock it loose again? Uh, no, I didn't touch it. I'm only 
getting one corner making contact. Okay, so I'll tell you right now, I would not want to be having to do any amount of hardwood with that. Let's see what it'll do. So Rob Bruce asked, do, would the difficulties on refurbishing an old Stanley plane be similar to the ones you're facing now on this Mastercraft plane? Uh, no, they were made better. Even the, even the inexpensive ones were made better than, than this. But I, uh, we did a whole video on that called uh, Great Hand Plane Revival. And that walks through it, but a lot of this, a lot of the processes are going to be similar. Now, to save this plane, what I'm going to do is work on this piece of cedar, and I think my uh, my final evaluation is going to be that if you're going to use, if you're going to buy a plane like this, and you're probably going to be restricted to softwoods. Now that doesn't feel bad. You know, I can pull a blade in a little. Now this is yellow cedar, which has about the same uh, specific gravity as white pine. I'm pulling the blade in a little bit more each time. Quite a bit of backlash, meaning where you engage the blade from forward to reverse. So if your only desire is to work mild woods, then this this uh, this will work. What I've noticed is that you're not capable of getting a very thin shaving. Yeah, the, the adjustment's a little bit funky just because that doesn't want to stay tight. And I've got it down tight as... In fact, watch what happens when I tighten it. It moves it forward. So if I'm sitting right up there and I start to tighten that, it actually moves the lever cap back. So there's a few little problems there, but I mean, you could make it work. I often am asked, this, or, or people will make the comment, well, I'm going to start off with something like this, and then I'll, uh, I'll get it, when I get better, I'll go to a better plane. I'm telling you right now, buy the better plane now. Number one, you don't have to replace it, and number two, you're going to have a far more pleasurable experience planing with something like this that has just got that nice, solid feel to it, doesn't bounce around, doesn't have that hollow ring, and it just moves through that wood like butter. Someone asked earlier if you could explain that first plane that you uh, showed, that expensive the one. The infill plane. Ron Brees? Yeah, what's the difference and why? Well, infills were uh, uh, infills, meaning it's got a metal, metal outside and it's stuffed with, in this case, rosewood. And what's the big de advantage? Well, pretty. In fact, with this one, the reason I bought it is because I knew Ron, and I thought he had uh, made, made a really nice product. It's a high angle. I think this might actually be a 55-degree pitch, so the blade is engaging the wood at 55 degrees instead of 45 degrees, so for figured wood, it's going to be a lot better. There's not a lot of adjustment on this. You don't have an advance and retract. You'd have to tap it with a hammer in order to move it. Uh, there's no lateral adjustment either, so that means you're going to have to tap. Always use a brass hammer, then you don't mushroom your blade. You, this is going to be your forward, this is going to be your lateral. So it's a little bit finicky that way. It's heavy, it's got a lot of mass. So when you're dealing with a high angle, 
where it really increases the effort required to push the blade through the wood, it's nice to have that extra mass. But I don't, I don't use this. I sit up there and just admire it. This is the workhorse. This is the one that it's, well, actually, that's not 100% true because it's my five and a half that I typically use 85% of the time. And this is just, if you're looking for a first purchase, then my recommendation would be the five and a half. Works extremely well on the shooting board. It's not too big to be highly effective in general purpose work, like surfacing whatever it is that you're dealing with. A Aaron just hopped on the. Oh, course. did he? Yep, they had A Aaron. A Aaron. We have not seen him or heard from him in a long time since he moved away from Seattle. He uh, got offered a job. He said he got offered that job during the class. He's, uh, he's uh, doing fine. Living happily ever after. A Aaron was one of our. Uh, he was a uh, route clearance guy. So they drove up and down, up and down uh, highways. Um, searching for IEDs. It's quite a nerve-wracking job. Dave would know all about that. Hey, hey Ron, good guy. Miss you. We should have a big reunion sometime. We get this place finished. Bring all these guys in. I'm just gonna, I'm going to uh, go over this piece of maple with my five and a half as a parting shot. While you're doing that, we had two more donations, one from Ash Bomer, $50, and one from James Bowen, uh, $50. Thank you, gentlemen. And then Emerson Bailey uh, bought uh, a T-shirt. So let me give you a, a quick recap on what's going on. Our May classes are full. We have all 14 spots for the vets taken care of. We've, we've sold out on the uh, civilian side. In fact, the October workshop, Lucy, what are the dates? Uh, six through... Same thing. No, no, one day different. I'm sorry, 7 to 11 and 14 to 18. And those classes are, we have 14 civilian spots and there are five ta already paid for. Now, this has never happened before. I told Jake today, I said, we will have, October will be sold out before we even have the May class. So if you want the experience of a lifetime, come to this class. And I'm not just talking about the woodworking. Just be around these guys and you'll know exactly what I mean. You'll go home a better person. What do we need to do to wrap it up? Do you have any ideas yet for the next live episode? What you're gonna oh, give me a break. We're just getting this one over with. We'll come up with something and we'll do the same thing. We'll announce it in plenty of time. We'll do a YouTube to promote it. My, uh, my final take on this, I would not, sp I would like to get my money back. Um, take it back, they might appreciate it. Yeah, you return it better than it was. Yeah, now somebody wants to buy it. We had someone today say, he can't make the live episodes. He goes, anything you sell, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll outbid anybody for, uh, by $10 up to 200 I couldn't do that to him. Anyway, if anybody wants this, give me a shout out and you can have it. You saw what it'll do. Um, I would not buy it, and it's not has nothing to do with the plastic handles. It just does not have the feel. The difference in mass, and this is the same with the Stanleys too. I've got I've got bedrocks that do not feel as solid as these, whether it's a Lee Nelson or whether it's a Wood River. Learn learn to sharpen you learn to use and sharpen a hand plane. The most efficient tool in the shop. Now, I've preached this time and time again, but when you guys finally figure it out, hey Luther. When you finally learn to use and sharpen a hand plane, how much of a difference did it make oh, to your woodwork? It's a world of difference. You, you, it's unbelievable. It, you, it opens an entire new world of woodworking and confidence, and it launches your woodworking. You and precision. Go. Unbelievable. Not to mention how much sandpaper you will no longer use. Dave, final words on hand planing? What has it done to your... Sharper the better. All right, any final questions? We're going home to uh, have salmon and scallops. <laughs> Anything? That it? All right, we're signing off. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being with us. Leave your comments below. I'm supposed to say like and share and all that subscribe. other crap about this. No, subscribe. subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe. All right, we'll see you in two weeks.